see how many uh, homeworks have we done so far. Um, we've done uh, the box plots. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was combined with the t-test, right? Yeah. Yeah, so box plots and t-test. Um, and then we've done... The uh, two different ANOVAs. Uh, we've done the CRD ANOVA. And we've done um, the RCB ANOVA. So those are three assignments, right? Mm -hmm. um, I will get those back to you here at some point. If, if you turned it in, I uh, will have gotten all the points. Uh, remember, we're not doing any exams in this class, right? It's just turning in homeworks and we're all good. Uh, so today, what we're going to do um, is we're going to talk about a different kind of ANOVA called the Latin Square. Um, then, uh, I don't know if I have the energy to do it today, but uh, the next design um, is then going to be what's called a nested design. So a nested ANOVA. These three ANOVAs right here are all one-way ANOVAs. Uh, after we finish the one-way ANOVAs, then we're going to start talking about um, cross-classification designs. So those are cross-classification. Uh, also known as um, multi-way or um, factorial ANOVAs, where there's more than one factor that you're looking at. Um, and that's simply an extension of what we've already done. Uh, it just gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of your experimental design. Uh, the most challenging one that we're going to deal with is the nested design. Uh, that one uh, takes some thinking about. Um, it can be a little bit challenging. Uh, and it's a design which um, people, when they apply it, they usually apply it incorrectly. So uh, we need to deal with that. Uh, after we've done the two-way ANOVA, so this is a two-way ANOVA, um, then it's easy to think about a three-way ANOVA, four-way ANOVA, 20-way ANOVA, whatever. Those designs become very big very quick, but they're all the same thing. So if you learn the cross-classification design, then everything else is trivial. Um, one important point is that um, all of the ANOVAs that we've done so far are, are referred to as Model 1 ANOVAs. Um, they are ANOVAs that are um, fixed effects models. So here, in everything that we've done, the factors are fixed. They, you either are a member of that factor or you are not. So uh, there's no variability there. Um, it's not like where one factor is temperature and temperature can fluctuate across all sorts of things. It is you are either a member of that group or you are not a member of that group. So we, we refer to those things as model one ANOVAs. Those are fixed effects ANOVAs. Okay? There are also ANOVAs which are mixed ANOVAs or mixed models. And we'll start dealing with that sort of stuff. Uh, when we transition from the ANOVAs into regression or other sorts of linear models. Um, and that turns out to be a pretty powerful tool. All right, uh, so what we're doing today then is we're going to talk about Latin square designs. Uh, and we'll see how much energy I have at the end of that. I'm pretty low energy, so my guess is all we'll get through is the Latin square design today. Um, all right. So, uh, Latin squares, uh, the, so, yeah, Latin squares, there is another kind of um, Latin square design. Uh, there is another kind of design called a Greco Latin square, just as there's Greco, what, what's that wrestling called? Greco, is it Greco-Roman wrestling? I think that's right, yeah. Which is really Greco-Latin wrestling, right? Because Latin is Roman, right? So we're talking about Roman square designs, Latin square designs, okay? 
Uh, the difference is that a Greco Latin square design is sort of a multi dimensional Latin square design. So, Latin square implies two dimensions, right? That you're going off in two directions. But we are doing a one way ANOVA. Okay? So, um, we're going to set this up where we have one thing going off in that direction, one thing going off in that direction. And what we're really interested in is something that's going along in that direction. Okay? So it kind of makes a square. That's where the concept of the square design uh, comes from. So even though it's a one-way ANOVA, what we're really trying to do is remove the effects of two factors. So in reality, we're dealing with three factors, and we want to remove the effects of two of those factors, okay? Um, and we want to do this design all at the same time. So it sounds on the surface like it's pretty complicated. And at first blush, it is. But it is an incredibly powerful experimental design. Of all the designs we're going to employ this semester, the Latin square design is by far the most powerful the most powerful per dollar spent. So it's a very efficient design. You can get a lot of bang for not a lot of bucks. All right? So we have to make some assumptions in order to make this work. So we're going to assume, right, we know what that means, right? Asks of you and me, right? But we're going to assume that there are no interactions between the various factors that we're looking at. All right? So no interaction. Also, so let's write that down. One, no interaction. No interactions between the various factors. Uh, the next thing is, and this is the hard part, is the number of treatments must equal the number of categories in each of the factors. So, to number of treatments must equal number of categories In the, two, in the other two factors. So the design is hyperbalanced. We have to have, for example, if we're doing a four by four Latin score design, we need four levels of one factor, four levels of the second factor, and then four levels of the factor that we're interested in, four levels of the treatment. As an example, let's imagine that we have, we want to test four different detergents. Um, so maybe these detergents are designed to um, uh, eliminate COVID-19. There's a nice handy dandy little feed into our current scenario. Uh, we've got four, four different detergents that we think will help us get rid of COVID-19. So what we're going to do now is we have four detergents. And we're going to apply this, these four detergents at four different hospitals. We don't care about the hospitals, all right? We care about the detergents. But we can't test all four detergents at the same hospital because we can't do them all at the same time. We need to do this stuff all at the same time, okay? And there are four different methods of application. So four methods of application. Well, these hospitals are different. Some of the hospitals are nice and shiny new. 
modern, modern ventilation systems, modern flooring systems, modern wiring, modern plumbing, all that good stuff. Some of the hospitals are really old. Old brick and mortar buildings with hardwood floors and all kinds of weird stuff going on. And some of the hospitals are a mix of the two and some of the hospitals are like tents or something like that. Okay? So the four hospitals are different. They're not equal to one another. The four methods of application are different. Maybe one application is a spray, one application you mop on, one application, you know, is something else. Who knows, right? We have four different methods of application. So here, then, is the setup. Notice it's, we refer to this as a four-square design, right? So now we've got our four hospitals. Hospital. We've got hospital number one, hospital number two, hospital number three, and hospital number four. Then we have four methods. We have method one, two, three, and four. All right. Four hospitals, four methods. That means we have 16 cells in here. And we've got four different detergents. How are we going to allocate these things? If we allocate detergent one here, detergent two here, detergent three here, and detergent four here, then detergent is confused or mixed up with hospital. Then we don't know if we find a difference in detergent, is it because of the difference in the detergent or is it because of the differences in the hospitals? Likewise, if we do detergent one, two, three, and four here like this, then we don't know if it's the difference in the detergent or because of the difference in the method. So we say that detergent is then confounded with method. So we have to set it up in a way where we avoid that problem. And the way we can do that, and this is where the Latin part of Latin square comes in, we're going to use Roman numerals. So we're going to use detergent one there, detergent two there, detergent three there, and detergent four there. Now, I need to use detergent two there, three there, four there, and one there. Detergent three here, four, one, and two. Detergent four, one, two, and detergent three. There are all sorts of different ways of doing this allocation. What some people will do is they'll set up a randomization routine to assign the first group here. But once you've done that, basically everything from that point is fixed. Because what you need is every detergent to show up in every hospital with every method. Only once. So here's detergent one shows up with method one, hospital one. Detergent one. Hospital 2, method 4. Detergent 1, hospital 3, method 3. Detergent 1, hospital 4, method 2. So detergent 1 shows up once with each hospital and once with each method. So it is hyper balanced. Okay? All right. On the web page, I've already put up the data set. It's a different data set than the one I'm giving you now. And I've already put up the R script for doing it. You need to pay very careful attention to the R script because it's easy to get it wrong uh, and come up with the wrong result. Okay, so as an example here, 
we're going to use these data. So there we have hospital, here we have method, and it's hospital one, two, three, and four. Now we have method one, two, three, and four. Let's imagine we get the following number. So here we get 8.7, 7.5, 8.8, 14.0, and 11.3. Here we get 9.2, 12.7, 9.2, and 8.7. We get 11.6, 4.6, 5.6, and 4.0. And here we get 9.1, 7.3, 6.7, .7, and 12.9. So then, y i dot bar is equal to 9.65, 8.05, Point seven five and nine point two two five. Whoops, I left off a dot. So it's y i dot dot bar. So our notation has changed now. We no longer have simply y dot or y i j. We now have y i j k. Okay. So I refers to hospital, J refers to method, and K refers to detergent. So now I have Y dot J dot bar is equal to 10.375, 8.75, 9 pardon my penmanship, 6.325, And then over here, 9.00. And then I have y bar dot 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 is equal to 8.9125. All right. Y dot dot one bar is equal to 7.45. Y bar dot dot 2 is equal to 6.85. Y bar dot dot 3 is equal to 12.8. And Y dot dot 4 bar is equal to 8.55. Okay. Those numbers are important if you're going to be doing it by hand, which you're going to do it by R, but it does give you a sort of flavor of what's going on because you notice that here for detergent number three it has the highest value, the lowest value is for detergent number two. It's been so long since I've worked with it or since I've thought about this data set, I don't even know what the numbers mean. I don't care what the numbers mean. As a statistician, it makes no damn difference to me, okay? Let's imagine that a big number is good and that a small number is bad, okay? So in that case, it would appear on the surface here at least that detergent three gets, on average across all methods and hospitals, the highest value. Which hospital has the highest number? Well, that would be hospital number one with 10.375. Which method has the highest number? Well, that would be method number one, okay? Notice that method one and hospital one don't line up with detergent number three. I mean, sure, detergent number three shows up for method one and detergent three shows up for hospital one, right? But never at the same time. All right.
let's write down what the model is. It's always important to know what model you're working with. I just uh, worked on a paper, uh, it was sort of an interesting idea, this guy is working on these naked mole rats in South Africa and they navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. And when he first sent the manuscript in, he said he did it as a nested design. And I couldn't figure out how he did it as a nested design, so I sent the manuscript, I rejected it and sent it back to him and said, you have to explain how this, how you, I need to know what the model is. He had no idea what I was talking about. So you have to, you know, and I gave him an example of what a nested model looks like you know, with all the little parentheses and things of that sort. But the same sort of thing that we're doing now, he had no clue. Ultimately, it turned out that he was not doing a nested design, so he ultimately got that straightened out. But it's important to know what your model is. It helps, you know, formalize your thinking about what's going on. If you think about your experimental study, about the data that you're collecting in terms of a model, your life is so much easier. So our model is this. Here's our response. Y, I, J, K is equal to mu. That's our overall mean. Plus alpha I plus beta J plus gamma K. Because we now have three factors. We have hospital, we have method, and we have detergent plus epsilon i, j, k. We do not have any replication within detergent hospital method scenarios. If we did have replication, then we would have an additional subscript, but we don't. Notice we don't have any interaction terms. We don't have any interaction between hospital and method. We have no interaction between hospital and detergent. No interaction between method and detergent. No interaction between hospital, method, and detergent. No, we're assuming that none of those terms are there. And that's a good thing because we don't have the degrees of freedom for those terms. So you'll notice that what we have is I is equal to 1 all the way to P. J is equal to 1 all the way to P. And K is equal to 1 all the way to P. All right? In other words, we have the same number of hospitals as detergents, as treatments. We're going to assume that the sum of all of the alphas is equal to the sum of all of the betas is equal to the sum of all of the gammas is equal to zero. Well, that's the same assumption that we've made every time before, right? So if you add up treatment A, you have two treatments, treatment A and treatment B. And treatment A is positive 5 and treatment B is negative 5. Positive 5 plus negative 5 is equal to 0. So that's the same thing. We're also assuming that epsilon i, j, k is independently normally distributed with mean 0 and variance sigma e squared. So that's the standard assumptions there. So we're going to assume, so assume, we've already assumed there is no interaction, that our P cubed um, populations are normal. We're going to assume, so there's one, we're going to assume that we have homoscedasticity. Now 
one is that all the variances are equal. We've already made the assumption that there is no interaction. And we're making the assumption that the epsilons are independent. So we could add something else to this term right here. We could say that these are i, i, and d, meaning identically, independently, normally distributed. So not only are they independent, but they are identically normally distributed. In other words, the error variance for each method and each detergent and each hospital is the same. All right, so let's work with this model. Let's subtract mu from both sides. So now I have y, i, j, k, minus, and I'm going to replace mu with my best estimate of mu. My best estimate of mu is going to be y bar dot dot dot. Put it in parentheses. So I've moved mu over there. That thing goes right there. So now I'm going to estimate alpha. And alpha is going to be y i dot dot bar minus y bar dot dot dot. So there's alpha. So it's the mean, right, for hospital mm -hmm. subtracted from the overall mean. So the mean for hospital 1 subtracted from the overall mean, the mean for hospital 2 subtracted from the overall mean, the mean for hospital 3 from the overall mean, and the mean for hospital 4 from the overall mean. And then do you go on to do with methods and... Um... Yeah, now, now we're going to do huh. beta. So now it's y dot j dot bar minus y bar dot dot dot. Mm -hmm. Here's my beta. Now I'm going to do gamma, so it's y dot dot k bar minus y bar dot dot dot, okay, plus the error term. Uh-oh. Now it's a little bit complicated. So let's figure out what the error term is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because I know it's additive, I know that this is equal to that plus that plus that plus that. So if I subtract these things from this side and from this side, then I know that epsilon is going to equal everything that's left over. So it's just algebra. So let's do that and see what we get. So now I have y, i, j, k minus y bar dot 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 minus y i dot dot bar, so minus a plus, so plus y bar dot dot dot, minus y dot j dot bar, minus a minus, plus y bar dot dot dot, minus y dot dot k bar, minus a minus, so plus y bar dot dot dot, is equal to epsilon. So that is equal to epsilon. All right. Minus y bar dot 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 plus y bar dot dot dot. So that cancels out. So I have y i j k minus y i dot dot bar minus y dot j dot bar minus y dot dot k bar plus 2 times y bar dot dot dot. So epsilon is equal to y i j k minus y i dot dot bar minus y dot j dot bar minus y dot dot k bar 
plus 2 y bar dot dot dot. Remember what we're trying to do. We're setting this up. We want this to be a variance term. And the variance is the sum of xi minus x bar quantity squared. An observed minus an expected. The mean is the expected value. So it's an observed, an observation, minus an expected value. An observed minus an expected. So I've subtracted off one expected. Minus the second expected. So I've subtracted off two expected. Minus a third expected. So I've subtracted off three expected. But I'm only supposed to subtract off one. So I've subtracted three off. I need to add two back. Which two should I add back? My best guess, the overall mean. So I'm going to add back two overall means. Okay. And now, if you think about it, it's kind of cool. Because in terms of my design, I'm going observed minus expected in that way. I'm doing that. Observed minus expected going like that. And now I've got observed minus expected going like that. OK. Let's um, start then just very briefly talking about um, some of the basics of a nested analysis of variance design. Here's the problem. Um, and the first time uh, I ever had to deal really, I mean, actually treat data from a nested design other than in a classroom setting was the very first year I got here. Um, there was a fellow in the department, an ichthyologist named John Sharp. Uh, and he did a lot of work on mercury and selenium and heavy metals. Uh, and he was interested in the toxicity of heavy metals and the developmental effects that they had on fish embryos. So in his lab, he had all of these aquaria and in each aquaria, he would administer different concentrations of these heavy metals. And in each aquaria, there were fish. And then he would follow those fish and then determine what the fate of those fish were, how many of them had various sorts of deformations or abnormalities and so on. If you think about it, once a fish is in an aquarium, it's not as though you can pick the fish up out of the aquarium and put it in a different aquarium. The fish, in some way, is locked into that aquarium as soon as you administer any of the heavy metals. Or, when you're done with the experiment and you rinse out these aquaria, you're not rinsing them out perfectly. There will be trace traces of those heavy metals still in those aquaria. So that aquarium represents the sort of thing that you can't get away from. The fish that go into that aquarium are not independent of that aquarium. OK? You can also think of it in the following way. Let's imagine we're interested in spruce budworm or bark beetles. Or you guys ever been out west, been, been in forests out west? I was in British Columbia a number of years ago. And I was there working on squirrels, obviously. And uh, we're up on this road in Canada. And you look out, and it's all coniferous forest, and it's all brown. And I turned to the guy that I was with, and he goes, yeah, 80% of the forests up here in British Columbia are dead. It's because there's this bark beetle, which has gotten into the Douglas fir. So they, they plant Douglas fir for timber, right? because that's what we like for 4x4 four four posts and for 2x4 lumber and all of that sort of stuff. And this bark beetle has gotten in there and is just wiping out these forests. It's crazy. So when a forest fire goes through, man, it burns hot and it burns fast. And it's a good damn thing when it goes through because that wipes out the bark beetle. 
and then you can start over. Of course, if you have a house built in the middle of all that, it's bad news. There are all these people that are developing these sprays that you can apply to kill these beetles. So imagine we have three sprays. We have spray number one, spray number two, and spray number three. And what we want to know is, are the sprays different? Is there a difference between the sprays? And what we're going to do is we're going to apply the spray to a bunch of trees. So each spray is going to be applied to four trees. Tree number one, tree number two, tree number three, and tree number four. One, two, three, and four. And then one, two, three, and four. But you recognize that tree number one here is not tree number one over here. So these are different trees from these guys. Mm -hmm. And that tree is firmly rooted in the soil. And it can't get away from the soil. So everything that happens to that tree is a function of the spray that's applied and what's happening to it in terms of where it's rooted. Maybe the soil is different, maybe the water regime is different, maybe the light regime is different, maybe it's on an east-facing slope rather than a west-facing slope, whatever. But you can't pick the tree up and move it someplace else. It's stuck there. Just like that aquarium. That aquarium has a certain mercury or selenium history, and you can't change that. It's stuck. And now from each tree, we're going to sample six leaves. That goes for each, each one here. Okay? So we're going to have 6, 4 times 6 is 24, times 3 total leaves. So 72 total leaves. The model then is going to be this. We're going to have y, i, j, k is equal to mu plus alpha i. So alpha i is our spray. And the spray is applied to these experimental units. And those are the trees. And that's beta. But if you think about it, what's going on with those leaves? Those leaves are firmly attached to the tree. And because the leaves are firmly attached to the tree, right, there's this connection between that tree and that leaf, and that tree and that soil. Mm -hmm. These things are, we say, nested within the tree. So the way we're going to specify that is by this. We're going to say that I is nested within J. And then I have my error term plus epsilon, and it's I j within k. So I'm going to indicate nesting. So here, actually, what I mean is that this, my tree, is nested within the spray. And here, my leaf is nested within the spray-tree combination. So i is my spray. Here's my, here's my tree. j is my tree. So tree is nested within spray, and here's my leaf. My leaf is nested within my tree spray combination. I can't take the leaf out. All right. Now things get a 
using. So I've got I equals 1 to A treatments. I've got J is equal to 1 to B um, experimental units. Those are my trees. And then I got K is equal to 1 to N subsamples. So it's different than what we had before. I didn't have subsamples before, I just had samples. But now I've got subsamples because those leaves are not all of the leaves, it's only some of the leaves. That tree might have had a million leaves, and I took six of them. Which six did I take? Did I randomly select leaves from the tree? you think? Maybe this is your thesis project. Mm -hmm. You're looking at, where you're trying to save the American chestnut. You're trying to save white oaks. You figured out some spray that's good for white oaks. You're testing three different versions of the spray. Now there you are, you're out at the Kelso Sanctuary and you found yourself a white oak and you've sprayed it. Now you want to sample some of the leaves. Which leaves are you going to take? There you are, you're out of Kelso all by yourself. There's the tree. Which leaves are you going to take? The ones on the bottom, probably. Yeah, the ones you can reach. Yeah. Which might not be the same as the ones on the top. Mm -hmm. And it might be just the leaves that are on the west side because you can't, the, the east side is on a slope and you can't get to it very easily. In other words, Ideally, you want those leaves to be chosen at random from the tree, but how are you going to do that? Random number generator. Every 100,000th leaf I'm going to take. <laughs> one, two, oh wait, no. One, two. I'm thinking not. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there's another issue that we have. So, here's the difficulty that we face. We're going to collect all of these six leaves from each tree. We don't know that they are really true random samples from the tree. 